Hey, this is Horner, and this is the Qualitative Impulse Momentum Worksheet. Uh, it's the Impulse Force Model Worksheet number one. And there's an equation at the top that I want to go through. Uh, this just means that the sum of the forces, or the net force, times the change in time that that force occurs is equal to the change in the mass times velocity. And here, we call the mass times the velocity, uh, we call that momentum. So when you see mv, that's really momentum. Now, momentum can't have the letter m because mass has the letter m. So instead, we use p. So momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Oops, mass times velocity, not mass times change, but mass times velocity. If I have a change in velocity, that would equal the force times the change in time. It's the same thing. We call the thing on the right momentum. And on the left, we're going to call this impulse. Uh, and impulse, the letter for impulse is J. Once again, this is kind of weird, but that's just force times the change in time. So that's the impulse momentum theorem. That's the equation that we're going to look at and use, and we'll talk a lot more about it here. Uh, if you throw a ball horizontally while you're standing on roller skates, you roll backwards. So if I have a person and they're standing on roller skates and they throw a ball in that direction, then their body will go in that direction. So we'll put little wheels here. So this would be after they throw it, the person would be here, and they would be moving in this direction, and the ball would be over here, and it would be moving in that direction. If this person held on to the ball instead, so they've got their roller skates on, when they push the ball forward, they're going to go backwards the same amount, but then they're going to hold on to it. They'll come back in the same amount that they pull the ball back in. So that is basically what we call conservation of momentum. So there's no change really in the momentum at all. Uh, next one says, which has a greater change in momentum? We have a 50-gram clay ball that strikes a wall at 1 meters per second and sticks, or a 50-gram super ball that strikes a wall at 1 meters per second and bounces away from the wall at 0.8 meters per second. So let's draw a little line here, and we're going to put a wall. And we've got a piece of clay that we're going to throw. So here's our piece of clay. It's going to come in, it's going to hit the wall, and then it's going to splat against the wall. So its original velocity here is equal to 1 meter per second, and its final velocity is equal to 0 meters per second. If I take that same wall again, and I throw a super bouncy ball at it, it will go in and it will hit the wall, uh, and it will be going 1 meter per second then it will rebound and it will come off the wall at 0.8 meters per second. So it lost a little speed probably due to uh, what we call elastic deformation where the ball gets squished a little bit and there's some sound and heat uh, generated. So the question is they want to know which one has a greater change in momentum. So remember we said change in momentum is mass times times the change in velocity. Notice they have the same masses so we really just want to look at their change in velocity. Remember, change of velocity is final minus original velocity. So our final velocity here is 0 minus, neg uh, minus 1. And so our change in velocity is negative 1. Over on this one, though, we have a uh, original velocity. Uh, we have it, sorry, we want the final velocity. So our final velocity is 8 meters per second. But we're going to say in this direction, we're going positive. So 8 meters per second would be really, 0.8 meters per second would really be negative 0.8 meters per second because it's going to the left and our original ball was going, and the ball originally was going to the right. So we're going to do the change in velocity again, which is the final. So that's negative 0.8 meters per second minus the original, which is positive 1 meters per second. So here, we actually don't subtract them. We actually add the two. So we get a change in momentum, a change in velocity of negative 1.8 meters per second. So because this change is bigger than this one is, if you do absolute value, then we would say that the super ball, super ball should have a greater change in momentum. For the next question, it says, I have a Hummer and a VW Beetle, and they're traveling at equal speeds, and they have a head-on collision. So here, let's draw our Hummer. So we've got kind of the truck-like thing here. 
So we've got our Hummer. It's a really bad Hummer, sorry. Got our Hummer, and it's traveling in this direction. I know it looks backwards. This is the front. That's just a little bit of the, the back with the, uh, the kind of the trunk there. And then we have a VW Beetle. So here's our Beetle. So we'll draw it real simple. And they have a head-on collision. When they have a head-on collision, this one's lighter, this one's a heavier. It says which vehicle will have a greater force of impact. It is exactly the same. Now, why is it the same? It's because Newton's third law, Newton's third law, says that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the Hummer cannot hit the little VW bug any harder than the VW bug can hit back. Similar to a person hitting a piece of uh, Kleenex. They can only hit that as hard as it hits back. The next one says which vehicle will experience a greater change in momentum. Um, so there, uh, therefore the change uh, in momentum is going to be the same. Now here's why. The force times the change in time we said is equal to the change in momentum, so the change in mass times velocity. They both have the same force. They also have the same change in time. So when they collide, they don't have a different collision time. They're, they're colliding together, so they can't have a different collision time. So because the force is the same between the two, oops, and the change in time is the same between the two, then the number I get here is going to be the same as the number I get on this side. Uh, so there's no difference there. It says, which, chain, which vehicle will have a greater change in acceleration? Justify your answer. So the Beetle will have the biggest change in acceleration. It's because, remember, your acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces over the mass. And because the force is the same for both, the one with the smallest mass will have the bigger change in acceleration. And that would be the Beetle. So the mass of the Beetle will, have, will be smaller and that force was the same, so it's going to give you a bigger change in acceleration, or it'll have a bigger uh, acceleration when it slows down. On the back side, it says discuss the following in terms of impulse and momentum. Uh, they want to know why are dashboards uh, that are padded safer than dashboards that are not. So it has to do with impulse. The impulse is the same for whether you have a padded dashboard or a hard dashboard. doesn't matter which one it is. Um, so your impulse, J, is going to be equal no matter which one of these uh, you have. So this is J for padded and then we'll do J for heart. So what is impulse? We said that is force times time. So on a padded dashboard, your force is really small, but your time is really big. So to make sure that we have the same uh, impulse here, we but this time, because it's a hard dashboard, we have a really small time of impact, and you have a really big force then. So that's why dashboards are padded in cars now. They didn't used to be, uh, but they are certainly are now. In fact, we have airbags there too. Uh, it wants to know in the next one, why are nylon ropes, which stretch considerably under stress, favored by mountain climbers? Well, it's the same thing again. We know that if I have a rope, okay, so the impulse for the rope, let's say that it's a, um, it's a non-stretching rope, okay? Uh, so let's just call this a tight rope. <laughs> Get it, tight rope. Uh, and then we have a stretchy rope. If the rope is really tight, then we know that the time of impact is really small. And that means that the force on your body would be huge. But with a stretchy rope, that rope stretches a bunch. So the time that it stretches then absorbs, uh, then that will allow that force to be really small, since our impulse will be the same for those two people. Next one says, uh, when starting a heavy train, why will train engineers sometimes back up, stop, and then proceed forward. Well, they do that, the engineer backs up so that each car is pushing against the one ahead of it. So when the engine begins to move, it's not really pulling on anything until that slack is removed from the first car. Then that begins to move. Using this technique, that engine is uh, only getting one car to start moving at a time. If the train was stretched out and each car was pulling on the other one, the engine would have to get the whole train moving at the same time. And that just wouldn't happen really well. Uh, so if you want to think about a picture, you can think about a couple pictures. So you could make some train cars, go ahead and make them stretched out a bunch. And if you do this, and then you have your engine up front, so here's our engine. 
uh, there's our engine of our, oops, this poor pin isn't working, there's our engine. Here's each one of our cars, and if there is a coupling between each one, and it's already stretched out, so we're going to put fake ropes here. If those are stretched out, when I pull on that first car, I pull all of them. If I have those cars, and instead of being stretched out, this thing is just not working, instead of being stretched out, I get them really close together so that there's a little bit of slack in between those couplings between each one. So here's another bit of slack. Um, then when that train pulls, we got to do one more car here. So when the train pulls, now it can pull on that first car. So there's a train. Not very good, I'm sorry. Uh, so when the train pulls on the first car, that has to release the slack here, which then pulls this car, which then slack pulls this car, and then this comes in slack and it pulls that one. Uh, and that's what we call bunching slack. And that is the end of this worksheet.